For those that don't know, our clocks here in New Zealand changed. Yes, they went back, ready for winter. Which means it's going to get a lot darker today. And it's a shorter working day, really, as a result. The good news is I got an extra hour in bed. Well, not quite a whole hour. Couldn't sleep, just got up because I knew I had a live stream. So here I am. Now, let's just give uh, YouTube a chance to catch up and I can see who is in the workshop. Okay, here we go. Come on, YouTube, you can do it. There we are. Well, it says upcoming. Oh, we're live. Come on, another go. Dum dum dum. Right, we are. It's the one. It's worked it out. Good job, YouTube. Got some adverts. More adverts. How do we get rid of that? Don't know. As always, thanks, YouTube. Top chat, Simon Rawl. Morning, Andy and crew. Happy birthday of midweek. That's right. I turned 52 years old on Wednesday, 3rd of April. Yes, can't forget my own birthday. Um, I was away from home, so birthday celebrations have been delayed somewhat because uh, at the moment, uh, my weekends are absolutely packed with getting Ben's new shed finished. Uh, it's well on the way. Things are looking extremely good. Uh, I made the doors last Sunday. Uh, you've seen those in the thumbnail. Uh, I've got to hang those doors today. And yesterday I made the bespoke hinges. Well, not the whole hinge, just the pins. Um, I'll show you those a bit later on. But yes, took two attempts. I messed up. I did. I wasn't really thinking straight yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but so more on Ben's shed a bit later on. Uh, the Giant, uh, good evening, Andy and crew. How is everything doing watching from South Africa? Well, the Giant, to be fair, I'm pretty knackered in all honesty. I've been away on the road. Uh, we had a bank holiday obviously over Easter. Monday was a day off, which was great. We've got lots of, uh, in fact, no, I made the doors on Monday. That's right, on the last day. Uh, I get mixed up in my days when we have bank holidays. And then Tuesday morning, very early start, I drove north uh, from here uh, through Auckland to a little village called Kaiwaka. And uh, I had, a, a, had to visit a motorcycle shop in Kaiwaka and then on to a place called Fangare, which is spelt with a W. So it's more like Wangare, as we call it, as, a, as English. I got to Wangare and um, I think I had a pizza for tea, yes, and I, but I was really tired. It was a long, long drive, lots of roadworks, lots of diversions, took a lot of driving hours to get up there, unfortunately. But that's sort of the way it is here in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and then Thursday morning, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, that was Tuesday, so Wednesday, um, did a another visit to a motorcycle shop in Wangare, uh, and then drove up to a little village called a little fishing village called Manganui, and uh, did some admin work, and then went out to the pub to celebrate my birthday. Had a pint, just the one, and uh, met a couple of lads who were fishermen, and we got talking about their uh, their boat, and he just installed new winch cables for his for his big nets and stuff. So that was quite interesting. We got talking about winch cables. Uh, and then they had to go off and get some fish from their boat to get the fish cooked at the local fish shop. So I disappeared, went back to the hotel and just basically just watched TV uh, for the rest of the evening. Uh, watched all about building cabins in Alaska, which was quite interesting. Uh, and a few other TV programs and then gave up. And then Thursday morning, drove about 30, 35 k's to Kaitaia. Uh, now, you'll know Kaitaia from the monkey bike trip. Uh, popped in to see Dave at uh, Kaiwaka, Kaiwaka Motorcycles uh, and basically spent the whole day there. Um, lots to do. It was an interesting day. They also had a, a warrant of fitness inspector, an audit uh, chap turned up. Uh, which uh, out of the blue wasn't booked in just that's how they work they just rock up and do an audit on spec and uh, pleased to say everything was as it should be yes there was a little bit of frantic uh, movements trying to find all the various paperwork and stuff that they needed uh, to show this chap but they got there in the end uh, their workshop's looking really good actually very very impressed got some uh, some senior techs on site now uh, had a couple of techs leave in the last few months 
Um, but senior techs have taken on some older chaps and um, yeah, very clever guys actually talking me through some some electrical problems that they've had to fix over the last few weeks. Uh, I was quite impressed, you know, honestly, very impressed. Uh, especially when they didn't have a wiring diagram available. Couldn't find one. I, they couldn't find one. Even I couldn't find one, which is most bizarre for that particular bike. But anyway, uh, and then Friday morning, uh, I had a very, very long day. Uh, left Kai Tire at quarter to six in the morning and drove all the way back to uh, to home. And I had a few little stops along the way, nothing major, a few things to pick up. Uh, but that trip took almost 12 hours um, to complete. So I didn't get home until quite late. Um, well, just after six, I think it was. And I was pretty knackered. I really was. And I haven't really recovered because Ben rocked up yesterday and uh, hence straight back on with the shed. So who else have we got? Uh, oh, some more from Vijay. Simon. Was it your birthday in the middle of the week? No, it was my birthday, Virginia. Uh, Thank you, Simon. Uh, thanks, Simon. <laughs> the real Daz. Morning, Andy and crew. Good morning, Daz. Welcome back, mate. Uh, Roger Heaps. Good morning, Andy and crew. Good morning, Roger. Hope all is well in sunny Invercargill. Yes, haven't been down there for a while. Uh, Virginia. Happy birthday, Andy. B birthday cake. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, yeah, I hope you had a wonderful birthday on Wednesday. It was all right. Um, however, it might have ended in disaster. Yes. As I was driving up to Manganui, and up in that area, there's two routes to get to Kai Tire. One is State Highway 1, which goes over the hills, and the other one is the, I can't remember the name of the road or what number the road is, but it goes around the east coast and then hoops around the top to get to Kai Tire. Well, State Highway 1 has been closed in that area for a very, very long time. Uh, they did repair it. There have been some massive landslips. They've built, rebuilt all the road, made it look very nice. I did get to drive it once, and then they had some more rain, and, well, basically the road slid to the bottom of the mountain. No, seriously, I'm not joking. The, the road just got washed away. Uh, this brand new road that these posh, well-paid engineers came up with uh, completely failed, and uh, it's not there anymore. And it's been closed ever since. Uh, so basically, the main and pretty much the only route, other than some gravel roads, the only route to Kai Tire uh, is via this diversion route through Manganui. So, needless to say, that road is extremely busy and not designed for that volume of traffic. Lots of trucks uh, hauling in both directions, and a lot of a lot of other cars and vans and that kind of stuff. Um, a volume of traffic you would never normally find on that particular road. Anyway, I was just pootling along, wasn't going particularly quick, wasn't in a massive rush to get anywhere. I was doing about 70, maybe 80 k's an hour, and I'd just gone over a climb, bit of a crest, and the road turned to the left to drop down the hill. And I had a couple of cars behind me, uh, and then the road did a, a, a gradual right, uh, and you could see a reasonably long straight, probably three, maybe four, maybe 500 uh, meters long. And then the road climbed and went around another corner. Uh, just as I came down onto the straight, big truck pops over the hill at the far end. And uh, a car was behind it, a blue car. God knows what it was, some kind of thing, Toyota Corolla or something. It was pretty beaten up. And as soon as the truck uh, lined up to the straight, while it was still on the downhill, this guy decided it would be a great idea to overtake the truck. Uh, now, just trying to build the picture for you, either side of this road are deep ditches. There is no pull-offs uh, whatsoever for that entire long straight. Uh, certainly on my side of the road, there was nothing available. Uh, and I was looking at this car going, you know, when you overtake something, the idea is you're supposed to be going reasonably, uh, you know, your speed should be quite a bit more than what you're overtaking, so you're not on the wrong side of the road for an extended period of time. And I was watching this car and it didn't seem to be accelerating. It was just alongside the truck. And I thought, he's going to run out of road. There's no way he's going to get past that truck before I get there. And I had a car right behind me, but I only had one option. And that was to get to swing into somebody's driveway at the start of that long straight on the left hand side, fortunately. And basically anchors on and got stopped. The car behind was thinking, what the hell's going on? Obviously, he wasn't looking ahead to see, you know, 
the the, the whole thing play out. Uh, I got stopped, and I'm not kidding you, right? The guy behind, he tucked in behind me, uh, and the car... Oh, got a text. Uh, the car was still overtaking the truck as it passed me. If I'd kept going, I would have run out of road, and I'd have had nowhere to go. So, that was a bit lucky, wasn't it? You know, to plan ahead. I, I, I would say that that's down to motorcycling skills, you know, reading the road and being a bit more observant to most drivers. The guy behind had no idea what I was doing. He was blaring his horn. He was not happy at all because I stopped really quick. Um, but I had no option. Uh, and he soon realized why I'd done it. You know, when he, when he saw the car, once I pulled in, he could see this car coming straight for him. So, um, yeah. It could well have been on my headstone, exactly 52 years old when he died. So, please, that wasn't the case, but a bit of a scare. Uh, and anyway, I, I pootled on to Monganui and, and just, as I, as I said earlier on, just chilled out, basically. Um, so, yeah, a bit scary. Uh, just shows that there are some idiots still on the road, many of them. Um, Simon, are those shed posts in as deep as them ones I put in last weekend? Four foot deep, four kilograms of post crete. Uh, well, Simon, uh, they did dig some big holes. The, the two main posts for the doorway, you, you saw the doors propped up against them. You couldn't actually see the posts they were behind. Um, the one on the corner, that is pretty deep. That's probably um, just over a metre, so three and a bit feet deep. Um, but it's got a lot of concrete around it uh, and because we mix our concrete and put it in wet. Uh, the one on the right... Yeah, yeah, good point. You've 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 unearthed uh, a, a bit of an issue here. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, that post was a little bit short. Now it, we hadn't planned to build this shed, and that was that. The second post was a cut off from one of the six meter posts for the side port. That one, drum roll, that one is only two feet into the ground. But all it's doing is holding a door. It's not there as um, a structural part of the building. It's an additional post, basically. Um, we put plenty of concrete around it, and we did dig the hole deeper by about another foot, which also got filled with concrete, obviously, as we filled it up. So the post is sort of mounted. It's encased in concrete, which is about 15 centimeters thick all around the post. And it's got this big additional foot of concrete bulb at the bottom so i do not believe that it's going to move it seems extremely solid um i'm sure it'll be fine but that's it was either that or we use a skinny little 100 by 100 post which would have looked really odd having a big thick post on one side and a skinny one on the other yes we could have extended the post and you know made a metal bracket to screw to the bottom of the timber to key into the concrete further down but i don't think it was necessary i'm pretty confident it's gonna be just fine um, so yes, uh, all the other ones are about a metre deep. Um, ben dug all the holes and uh, we did actually set another post, another big post, further in the garden in line with the three that were already in for the side port. So we've now got all four posts in position and concreted, all good to go for the side port. So as soon as we finish Ben's shed, I'm going to flick across, providing the funds allow, and we're going to make a start uh, or continue with the side port. Uh, we're not going to get it finished for a while because there's quite a bit of expense. There's a lot more timber to buy because I used a lot of it on Ben's shed. Um, there's the corrugated iron roofing to, which well, is not really corrugated iron anymore, but there's the steel work for the roof to, to purchase. And I've got to make a lot of brackets for the top of the big posts. Uh, I've decided how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to get them laser cut. I've, you know, I'm going to do it all in-house. Uh, we're going to use some 100 mil wide by something like 12 or 14 mil thick steel plate, which will be welded as a T. Uh, the weld will be ground back and I'll drill all the holes and we'll, we'll just do it that way because it, A, it's cheaper and B, it's just easier because I can design each bracket to suit because there are a couple of varying brackets and it saves drawing them all up to give to the laser cutting lads, which takes a lot of time. Anyway, uh, Jamie Clark, happy birthday, mate. Mine is Thursday the 11th. I'll be 51. You are on my coattails, Jamie. Only a year younger. Good man. Well, in advance, happy birthday for your 51th. 
51st, 51st, 51st birthday. Good man. Uh, Richard Perry. Uh, hi, Andy and crew. Hope you had a great birthday. It was all right. I mean, I survived, which was nice. Um, but we're going to postpone the celebrations until Ben's shed is finished because he's down here every weekend at the moment. And, um, you know, you know what I'm saying. Right. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, what's the pie today? Right. Thanks, Des. Uh, unfortunately, I ate it yesterday. <laughs> I did. But in my defense, it's a pie we've already done. It was one that I picked up on route. Didn't get around to eating, left it in the glove box. Well, actually, in my defense, left it in the center box of the Ranger, which is actually cooled. So chances are it was fine, and I, I felt fine afterwards. But um, because we'd already done it, and I was hungry yesterday morning, uh, I ate it. So my sincere apologies. Uh, it wasn't great, but it had a big lump of gristle in it. So uh, again, without a doubt, the Wild Bean Cafe steak and cheese, sorry, gourmet steak and cheese pies have definitely dropped in quality got up in price dropped in quality not impressed in all honesty um i found myself going for their um their pepper steak pies more recently i think they must have run out those that day anyway so uh, yeah they need to work on their quality control for sure especially on the meat side of it um right simon when uh when you've been on a bike for a few years you seem to develop an extra road sense you do without a doubt and i I became a motorcyclist for the road uh, a few years before I passed my car test. And I think that massively improved my road awareness. It saved me many times over the years. I mean, as you know, I cover a lot of, a lot of, lot of miles when I'm driving. And I've driven all my life, um, probably covered millions of miles by now. Um, and if it does, it gives you that sort of sixth sense. And even when there's nothing... It's weird, and I can't really explain it, but even when there's nothing really obvious on the road, you sort of get this, it is literally a sixth sense. You go, hmm, something's not quite right. Whether it's a little policeman hiding behind a bush or, you know, some accident just about to occur ahead. Um, you know, you, you just think, I'm just going to slow down a bit. I'm just going to just take it easy for the next couple of miles. And sure enough, something usually happens. Um self-preservation that's what it's all about and i always I have a very strict rule i don't speed I, especially when i'm work, during work time there is absolutely no need to speed uh, i get there when i get there and if something was to go wrong and you were speeding the first thing your employer would say to you why were you speeding you know so you've got a duty of care to yourself uh, and you've got to follow the rules simple as that really you know when you're on the road all the time um all <laughs> Saying that, some of the truck drivers in New Zealand absolutely categorically don't adhere to the speed limits, um, especially because of that diversion. They were under the pump and they were foot down. Um, I was doing 100 k's an hour, so that's about 102, 103 on the speed on, on my particular ute that I drive because it's got slightly larger tyres. Um, and speedos, just for those that aren't aware, uh, speedometers in regular vehicles through manufacturers intervention naturally overread they do that deliberately uh, so normally with the standard size tires you'd be looking about 110 on the speedo to be actually going 100 k's an hour and i've checked that with gps and it's about right and i always check it on every car that i drive you know if i'm driving it regularly every work vehicle that i get it's a very simple check to do um, but because the tires are a very slightly larger rolling uh diameter rolling radius rolling rolling circumference um then it has brought that down to being almost bang on uh, a couple of k's more and you're about on the speed limit and you can see that when you, you know here in new zealand when you're going into villages and stuff they've got lots of little um you know monitoring things at the side of the road that tell you to slow down if it thinks you're speeding and it gives you your actual speed and when i'm doing about 52 k's an hour on the speedo it will flash sort of 49 50 it'll sort of flicker between the two so i know i'm about there um, but I don't see any reason why I need to speed at all. And more, you know, more often than not, I'm towing a trailer, which means I'm, I'm down to 90 k's an hour anyway. Um, unlike many other people towing trailers, which just basically drive the same. It just doesn't bother them. Uh, but that's another rant for another day, isn't that one? Um, right, what are we on to now? Oh, Route 66 music. Nice. Uh, hello, Andy. Oh, hola. Oh, oh, is it hola? Uh, hello, Andy. 
San, hang on, from Brazil. Joseph, uh, from San, somebody, I've got a heart in the way, sorry, mate. Uh, from Brazil. So, hello, jo uh, jo Josias from Brazil. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, I've not seen your name pop up before in the comments, so this may be your first time. So, I'm sure we all welcome you to this little mini community that we have. Um, and today, it's, I'll show you around the workshop and what I've been up to. Um, but it, it really, the live streams are more of just a get together, an informal chat for a Sunday morning, my Sunday morning, usually your Saturday, something or other. Uh, and we get to talk about current uh, stuff that's going on, basically. One thing that, um, and can, that I've been talking to Mrs. Mechanic about recently is yesterday. Where were we? We're outside. I think we're outside in the workshop. Yes. And we would, we'd had a little, we're having a little break and we were talking about world population. Weird, I know, odd, odd subject to discuss. And I said, oh, it's about six billion. And she said, no, it needs more than that. She said, no, it's about, they said at school it's about six billion. So I went on to Google and uh, typed in what's the world population. And I eventually I ended up on this, um, what was it called? It was like a world, a world thingamajig. Let's have a little look. Uh, this is very scary, by the way. Uh, here we go, look. world o -meters. Right. Prepare yourself to be astounded. So I'll just give you a couple of stats first before we go into this. When I was born, 1972, because I'm 52 years old, there was just under 4 billion people on the planet. And of course, I added to that when I was born by one. And I thought, you know, what is it like? Hang on a minute. It showed me, showed me a live thingy. World well, meter. How do I get onto that now? I don't want to install that. Go away. Go away. Uh, anyway, maybe it's going to show me on here. Install. I don't want to install it. So. It brought up a live counter. I'd, I'd love to show you the counter, actually. Let's try and find the counter. Well, don't need to. What the hell? Don't want that. Just bear with me, because it's pretty cool. All right. I don't want to install that. Go away. Uh, okay, let's just Google... <laughs> Thing. Bear with me, bear with me. So, world population counter, can't we? You guys have already beat me, haven't you? I know you have. Live, here we are. This is it. Didn't know how to get onto it. Retrieving data. It's counting all the people. Holy crap. So, bear in mind some stats. When I was born, just under 4, million, four billion people on the planet. When I was at school, they, they taught us it was about 6 billion, so it had gone up, you know, by 50%. And now, it's over 8 billion people. So, I was absolutely astounded at this. Now, yeah, this isn't going to be absolutely exact, I'm sure, but it's, it's clicking away rather unnervingly. It's just going up and up and up and up and up, right? Um, I'm still here. So in 52 years, the world population has more than doubled. Just think about that. That's a lot more people. Another 4 billion people on the planet. More than 4 billion, actually, because uh, it was like 3.9 billion when I was born. So 4.2 billion people additional on the planet. More than twice as many since I was born, in my lifetime, and I hope to be around for a lot longer. So, you know, what's it going to be like in 10 years' time, 20 years' time? Because, obviously, the more people there are, the more people that there are going to be, it's going to be exponential, isn't it? And that number just keeps clicking up and up and up. Uh, and I find it quite disturbing watching that number climbing up so quickly. Um, yeah, births today, 152,000 people, children, obviously, have been born today. Deaths today, 68, 69,000, near enough. Population growth. There's an additional 83,000 people on the planet 
in the last 24 hours. Wow. Nothing to do with mechanics, but it blows my mind. And the pressure that we're putting on this planet, the demands, the food supply, the transport, there's mechanic stuff, the, the infrastructure to support all those people. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. No wonder we've got so many problems here. You know, it's just staggering. Absolutely staggering. Anyway, uh, where do we get to? Um, Stuart Martindale. Right, Stuart. Hi, Andy and crew. About 20 years ago, I was riding through Scandinavia. And on the third day of doing very high miles, I had an experience as though I was watching myself ride. It was most odd in the zone. That is really weird, isn't it? Almost like an out-of-body experience watching yourself ride down the road. Freaky, isn't it? What, what, can, what can go on in the human mind? Uh, Simon. If, you, if you're in the wrong year, speeds... Hang on. If you're in the wrong year, speed sensor to band of motorbike, is, it, it reads doubled. Lesson learned on checking part numbers. Oh, really? Is that right? So if you get the speed sensor wrong from one year to another, then your speedo reads, reads twice, reads double. Shit. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Connor K. Hey, Andy and crew. Sorry I'm late. Time changes caught me up. Sorry, Connor. My fault, matey. It's always my fault, isn't it? I did put out a little post earlier on this morning. Maybe I should have done it yesterday. Yes, I should have done it yesterday. Just to remind viewers that things are, you know, time's in flux at this end a little bit. Uh, the Giant. I was also born in 1972 and was very shocked how many more people there are in the world today. Words can't really explain just how flabbergasted I am, how amazed I am about the whole thing. You know, more, more airplanes need to fly around, more food, more roads, more jobs, obviously. It's just, it's sort of spinning up, isn't it? You know, gone are the good old days, and I can see why now. I can see why governments are trying to legislate the crap out of everything we do, because, well, they just can't, if, they just can't control it. You know, they can't control all these people. Not not what they, not the fact that they're having children, obviously, but the fact that there's so many more people to look after. But, you know, saying that, twice as much tax coming in, right? It's twice as many people having jobs and paying tax. It's got to be. Daniel. Hello, Andy, Mc Andy and Mrs. Mechanic and crew. Good morning, Daniel. Welcome to the workshop, mate. Right, so I'm going to see if I can get rid of this shop thing because I can't see everything at the moment. Uh, if I do that... Oh, there we go. That's better. Doesn't scroll, though. Top chat. Top chat, live chat. Top chat, live chat. Spam comment. Okay. Right, well, don't do that. Thank you. Right. Okay, so... Uh, I've covered through what I was doing last week. Let's have a little chat and I'll cover what I'm going to be doing next week because it, the, the, the roller coaster of my life doesn't stop. It really doesn't. I don't know how to get rid of this. I don't know how to get rid of this. Oh, God. Right. It's all too complicated. Okay. So... Uh, ben will be driving back north later on today, so we've got to really crack on. As, and the live stream, I think we'll just stick at an hour because there's no pie today. Uh, for those that just joined us, sorry, no pie. Didn't get a chance to get one picked up. Well, the one that I did pick up I ate yesterday, which was one that we've already eaten, so there was no point in putting it on the live stream. I think we've done it twice already, so and it wasn't very good, in all honesty. Um, so Ben goes back to Auckland um, late afternoon, evening, whenever he go, decides to go. He probably won't leave it too late because he's he's knackered as well and he's hurt his back as well, poor lad. Um, and then Monday morning, 
I've got a little bit of admin work to do before I leave, and then I've got to head north to Auckland, not far, you know, I'll be a few hours behind Ben. Uh, little trailer, on the little trailer will be an ROV, and in the back of the ROV will be a little motorbike that's got to go back to work. Um, drop that off, staying in Auckland Monday night. Tuesday is Ute Service Day, so I'm down to uh, South Auckland Motors in East Tamaki. Uh, they've got a full service to do on the Utes. They've got both front calipers to rebuild, new pistons, new seal kits. Uh, more, I'll give you some feedback on this. I'm pretty confident that they won't have ordered the parts and they won't have allowed the time to do the work. I did tell them what needed to be done when I booked the vehicle in for a service, but the young lady I was speaking to, I think it was way over her head. So I haven't given them any more heads up. I haven't given them a reminder. I'm just going to rock up and say, yes, it's here for a service. It's here for the calipers to rebuild, be, be rebuilt. Um, and also the last thing to do while it's here is one of the wheel, so the tire pressure sensors has failed. So you've got to work out which one it is and replace it, please. And you know, recode it and stuff. Will they allow time to do all that? I very much doubt. They tend to just focus on basic servicing, get them in, get them out, get the next one into service. Um, to, to rebuild the calipers, I, I've no idea. I mean, it shouldn't. Couple of hours, take them off, strip them, hour and a half, bleed the system up, away you go, Mr. Young, you're all good. Uh, I don't know whether they've done an op, so I'll, I'll let you know on the next live stream whether they've made a mistake. This is the same dealership, uh, South Orchard Motors, which serviced it last time round, and when they serviced it, they allowed it to go out the workshops with the brake pads um, pretty marginal, to be fair, and both front brake discs were already under the minimum thickness. So they should have replaced them, but they didn't. Uh, they're a bit slap happy up there, to be honest. Don't get it, don't get it. They seem to focus on servicing times, get the service done, get it out the door, get the next one in. They don't seem to do a proper inspection of the vehicle and then do any additional work that's required whilst it's there and say, hey, I'm sorry, can't have your car till tomorrow. Here's a loan car and they make more money out of you. That's how I run a workshop, is to maximise the income. And obviously, you've got to have good customer service, but I think spotting the fault and fixing it there and then is good customer service. Obviously, the customer's got the choice. Do, you, do we do the brakes or not, sir? Um, but for me, being a company vehicle, of course they would have done the brakes. And by the fact that they didn't do the brakes, it meant I had to get them done down in Queenstown, which was a massive inconvenience when I was there because we were running an event. It just happened that I managed to squeeze a day to get the work done. Well, an afternoon, it didn't take them all day. Well, they replaced the brake discs. They couldn't do anything with the calipers. The base of the brakes had overheated from towing a big trailer down a very, very steep hill. Um, brakes on the trailer. In fact, it was the brakes on the, tra the trailer were the brakes that I did, the electric brakes. And I said to you at the time when I did it in the video, these brakes aren't gonna be as powerful as they used to be because the, um, the magnets in the electric brakes weren't as powerful. So they can't apply as much braking force. And that was exactly the problem. Uh, so I was using engine braking coming down the hill. You can, you can manually select the gears in the Ranger. Uh, and even that wasn't enough. The brakes overheated coming down that hill. Uh, a bit scary, but we did get stopped in the end, just. So just another classic case of a dealership not doing what they're supposed to do. And we see it all the time, unfortunately. Uh, now then, uh, Daniel, I'll send you a boat load of pictures in a minute. Right, okay. Uh, we've got one down there from Simon as well. Just hang on, hang on. We've got some more. There he is. Um, Simon, did you ever use the digital car balance you got? Was it any good? Yes, yes, there's a video on it. Uh, I did the CB750 car balance with it, and it was brilliant. Really, really good. In actual fact, we've opened a, oh, there's a new dealership down south, a new motorcycle shop that's just opening from scratch. They have no kit. Uh, so I put together uh, a list of all, what I've, well, I tried to cover as much stuff as I could. There's obviously stuff that I'll have missed. Um, but they will obviously need a car balancer. That's Simon. Uh, sorry, Daniel, bringing through the, the pictures. Uh, we'll have a look in a minute. Um, thank you, Daniel. Now, uh, so I actually listed that particular, particular car, electronic car balancer that I got sent from the Australia at, <laughs> uh, on that list of workshop items. Uh, it's, it's a new dealership. Uh, it's part of a chain. 
Um, they've got one other motorcycle shop, I think, here in New Zealand, uh, but they specialize in tractors. Um, so they're not that familiar with motorcycle stuff. So I thought putting a list together for them would be, would be really helpful. And it also means that when I go back there... Thanks, Dan. Uh, when I when I go back there, they should have all this nice new gear. Uh, I did mention to them about a scope, but I said, look, there's no point in you buying an oscilloscope um, unless you also have the staff trained to use it. Uh, but they do act, they did actually buy a, an oscilloscope for the other bike shop, although they haven't really had the training done, and that's why I mentioned that part of it. So hopefully, I can push the training side this time around. And they'll get it done because they can use a scope on anything right it doesn't have to just be that one particular brand they can even use it on the tractors which would be really helpful um so yes i've used it for that one simon but i haven't used it since it's in one of the drawers over there somewhere to be perfectly honest nearly all of my bikes are all single cylinder so it's not really that useful to me for other projects but it was brilliant for doing this the, the k2 it really was absolutely spot on very impressed with it uh, the giant. Uh, I work for international trucks. We have to do a complete inspection besides what work is assigned to us and not allowed to skip out any of the work. And that's how it should be. I mean, that, that truck that I drive, it's a, it's a work vehicle. It covers a lot of miles and I 100% rely on it. I can't have problems. If I have a problem with it, then it causes me problems, delays, I have to reschedule stuff. Um, it needs to be right when it leaves the workshop. And I tell them this right at the start of the service, anything that needs to be done, do it now. You know, unless, of course, you haven't got the parts, then we'll have to schedule it. But, it, you know, you need to do a proper service. Prepare the vehicle for the next 15,000 kilometres and anything that's going to wear out be between now and then, potentially needs to be replaced now that's how i service stuff and that's how i expect you to service it i don't want to be coming back in five thousand k's time to have the brakes done that's not how a service works in my book so anyway next week up to auckland uh and then i say i'm getting the car serviced it's a ute serviced the pickup truck serviced on the tuesday and then Wednesday morning, bit of admin work, head office, and then I have to then bring the trailer home with another ROV on the back, uh, on the trailer, uh, to get undersealed. Woohoo! We're going to be doing some undersealing again. Fantastic. Looking forward to that so much. Um, dropping that off. So I'll be at home Wednesday night, drop that off, leave it on the trailer. And then Thursday morning, early start. I've got to drive from home all the way to a place called Wairau, I think it's called. It's just north of Napier. I say just north, it's like two hours north of Napier uh, on the East Coast. And um, the most direct route is to go to Rotorua or just south of Rotorua. And then there's a road that runs um, all the way across directly to that particular township, what Wairau, I think it's called. And uh, But some of it's gravel. It goes past a couple of Landcorp stations. I've driven it a few times. You've got to be careful down there. Some of it's a bit narrow. Um, but the only alternative is to go right round via Gisborne, which is many, 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 many more kilometres, or to go to Napier and then hang a left and go north from Napier. And the road to Napier uh, is littered now with 30 kilometre an hour sections, which are about five kilometres each long. Uh, which has added at least another half an hour to that journey time. So it will actually now be quicker to go on the direct route rather than stay on the main the main roads. Uh, and that's the route I'll be taking. Uh, so I should get there. I reckon it'll take me five hours, four and, maybe four and a half hours to get there with brakes. Uh, there'll be a, I'll take some fuel somewhere as well because we're a bit low on juice. Um, I've got a visit to do, uh, a prospect, and then... Um, head back down to Napier, uh, stay in Napier for the night. I'll do, I'll visit a motorcycle shop on the Friday morning and then I'll be driving home. But uh, from Napier, I'll drive home directly down State Highway 5, the one that's full of these 30k zones, uh, which would be a nightmare. Uh, I'll that'll take me to Taupo, and while I'm in Taupo, hopefully I'll get there before they close. 
Uh, I'm going to call it Bunnings, uh, which is a bit like a, a B and Q or a Mitre Ten Year Home Depot kind of place. Uh, ben had a couple of Makita. He bought a kit, Makita kit, a couple of, uh, year ago, two years ago, eighteen months ago, something like that. Uh, a drill and an impact driver both failed. The impact drivers failed already previously and replaced it. Uh, so I took them both down and said, hey, this isn't good enough, guys. You know, the, the impact drivers failed again, and now the drill's playing up, and the, the main bearing for the chuck is, is completely shot. The chuck's all over the place. You can't drill an accurate hole with it. So I said, that needs to be sorted out as well. Under warranty, please. It hasn't lasted anywhere near as long as it should do. I've got other Makita drills that have lasted way longer than this. Uh, so they, I thought they were going to replace them, but they didn't. They said, oh, no, we'll send them off, and then Makita will decide. So anyway, got a message to say that they're both ready. So whether they've replaced them or repaired them, I don't know. We'll find out, and I'll show you on the next live stream. Um, but yeah, Makita Tools. That brand new drill that I bought failed within about half an hour of using it. Not very impressed. Both of these two tools that Ben bought have both failed and repeat fail on one of them. Um, it does seem like the quality is dramatically reducing on Makita gear. Um very very unimpressed um you know i was am i still i don't know i'll have to have a rethink uh, a great supporter of mikita gear and i've used it for many many years both mains powered stuff and the uh, the battery powered stuff as well and i don't know i think it's starting to wane a little bit but i'm way too far down the rabbit hole to switch brands um ben's given me those two tools he says look he's switched to a different brand now he says look they're no good to me if you take them back and get them fixed, you can keep them. Uh, and they came with two more batteries, which was great. Batteries were uh, really valuable to us because we, I think we've only got five or six. Now we've got, you know, a couple more. Uh, and they were both six amp power, which is a great, a great addition to our, our kit. So thank you, Ben. Really appreciate that. Oh, so I should get home. I'll get some tea while I'm in Taupo, and I should get home probably about half six, maybe seven o'clock that night. I think Bunnings close at, I'm hoping they close at six, like my to 10, but they're in the town, they're in the city centre, the town centre really. So they might close at five. I just don't know, I'll have to Google it. Um, and then Ben will be here again Saturday morning. I think he's going to come down on the Friday night. So Ben will be arriving uh, a few hours after I arrive home. And then we've got the Saturday, Sunday again back on the shed. Uh, and we're going to be concreting, or at least starting to, he's going to be starting to dig out the floor. Uh, we'll have to get some some rubbly stuff to put in there and compact down. He'll, he'll hire a, a whacker for compacting all that down, uh, and then we'll set up ready for concreting. We're not going to be able to get the whole pad done in one hit. Uh, we're mixing the concrete but you know, in the cement mixer. So we'll have to probably do it in three stages. Um, we might get one of the stages done um, on Saturday, so we'll get it dug out and the compacting done and one slab done on the Saturday. That would be great if we can. And then we've got two more slabs to do on the Sunday before Ben then heads back north. What I'm doing that following week, I have no idea at the moment. Everything's just up in the air. I've got a plan, hasn't been signed off. If it gets signed off, I'll be doing the plan and I'll, you know, I'll recap further down the line. Uh, where do we get to, uh, Simon? Almost had to get the scope out today. Ooh, sounds interesting. Uh, did the timing belt on the wife's car. Started it up. The engine was misfiring like hell. What have you done, Simon? Uh, said, ooh, fook. Spelt F-O-O-K for YouTube's benefit. Uh, then... Then re what? Resealed. Oh, you found a coil pack unplugged. Oh, dear. Yes, that would do it, wouldn't it, Simon? But hey, happens to the best of us. We do forget things. <laughs> well spotted, mate. But yes, it's that sinking feeling when you fire something up and it's not, you know, it's not right instantly. You're like, oh, no. What have I done? What didn't I do? What did I get wrong? But yeah, that was a lucky one. Just plug that back in and we're all good to go. The Jains, what is the best cordless electric power tools you would recommend? I actually can't answer that anymore. 
um, I would I would have said to you, Makita, uh, years ago, uh, or even last year, I'd still say to you, Makita. I think Makita Power Tools are brilliant. However, now with the recent experience that both myself and Ben have had with some of their tools, um, I'm not that impressed. I mean, I bought I bought a little uh, rechargeable circular saw. Very very useful. Don't get me wrong. Super useful. Saves bringing a lot of timber into the workshop to cut when I can cut it on site. Saves a lot of to and fro up and down ladders and things. Not very powerful. It's a bit Mickey Mouse. It only takes one battery. I think if they'd made it take two batteries, made it 36 volts, it would be a far better tool. But yeah, sure, it'll be a bit heavier. It doesn't really need much of a bigger uh, blade size. The blade size is fine for everything I use it for, and it does do the job. It just sounds a bit slow and it does struggle a little bit now and again. Especially if you haven't got your cut perfectly straight. It will happily just, it's got an auto cut off and it'll, it'll very easily just cut off and you're like, well, that's not ideal. I've now got to try and extract my saw and start again. Um, so yeah, it's all right. I'm not massively impressed like I used to be with Makita stuff. So I don't know. Time will tell. Am I considering switching brands? It's a big expense, isn't it? It's a massive expense. But I think I'll consider it maybe when I come to buy something new. So give me some feedback. So, you know, tell me what you think. They've, all, they've got to have a good range of tools as well, to be fair. Um, so the giants, I've let you down there, mate. I don't want to say Makita anymore. I'm sure that our little our little group will give you some pointers. Uh, John Tyson, Bunnings Tauper, close at six, oh, top bloke, close at 6 p.m. on a Friday. The call is their website. Cheers, mate. You <laughs> Honestly, it's, you guys are so cool. You really are. Uh, Daniel, pictures. Sorry, Daniel, we went down a rabbit hole as always. Bear with me, people. Oh, my God. Right. Oh, oh, it's got a different kind of a thingy on it now. What the hell? Right, it must have updated. Okay, so let's start with this one. Oh my word, I'm just gonna flick through them, Daniel, because you know, I have put pictures on Facebook, uh, on YouTube before that have bit me on the ass, big time, especially when I'm looking at websites and things. Oh, uh, Jesus, so many photos. Good job, mate, good job. Very good job, actually. Look at that. So many photos. Holy crap. Okay, where do we start? If I go back and then reopen it again. Okay. So Daniel's been working on a house. Daniel does a lot of house stuff. Uh, there we go. I think we're going the right way. Look at all these. I'm just going to flick through. That's, that looks like the finished job, all painted up. Done the guttering. Very nice. A lot tidier than Ben's shed. I know that. Yes, it was pretty bad, wasn't it? I've got some rot. In that far corner of the workshop that I'm going to have to replace those timbers at some point. There's a big hole that spiders can get in. I don't like it. Oh, by the way, Mr. Mousy is back in the workshop. Saw him this morning. So, sorry, that one's a bit dark. Oh, you've been working hard, mate. I'll give you that. You do a good job. So this is to keep all the leaves and stuff out of the gutter, isn't it? Very good idea. I like that. Can do with some of that. Get any windows level. Oh, and a porch to go on as well. Good man. Wow. That's a lot of inside stuff. Look at all that. Top bloke. Put me to shame, you do. Totally. Holy moly. And there's more. I've got to show all of them. If I don't show all of them, we're in trouble, aren't we? They look like the same pictures. I think they're the same pictures. Right. Thank you, Daniel. Very, very impressive, actually. It was in a bad state, wasn't it? A really bad state. Jeez. Holy crap. Well... 
excellent work is all I can say. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, where do we get to? Cigarettes burning itself out. Um, the Giant. No worries down there. I used to buy the Bosch line, but they also have the up, their ups and downs. Yeah, I've gone well away from Bosch. I used to buy... I had a Bosch drill. Uh, it had an old one, and it, a mains-powered one. It lasted for years. I had to drill some big holes in concrete, and that, that was the start of the, of the demise. In actual fact, I think we put it on the lathe and blew it up. There was a video on that. Uh, just finished it off on camera. Uh, so that went in the bin. Have we had a Bosch angle grinder? Don't think we have. Um, yeah, the old, I just, oh, I had a little Bosch rechargeable screwdriver. That was crap. Really, again, years ago, before battery technology had really got going. Um, but it was rubbish. It put me. It did, I think that put me off. Um, so yeah, don't buy Bosch. Um, Daniel, this house was in a three, a three alarm fire. Wow, so it's pretty bad then. Uh, Simon, you must be into house flipping by now. Like, yeah, I mean, the amount of work that you do, you could, you could make some good money on doing that. Uh, Daniel, gutter guards. Yes, we get that kind of stuff over here. It's not quite the same. They have like a like a whiskery thing, like a giant pipe cleaner. You know, you put in there and uh, gutter witch, I think they're called, if you want to Google it. Uh, we haven't got those here. Our gutters are full to the brim at the moment. Uh, in actual fact, the gutters need to be replaced on our house. Uh, Roger Heaps, local repair guys here say they don't see AEG battery tools. And say they are well built. I haven't used them. AEG. I've heard of AEG. Yes. But I've never used any. John Tyson. I just buy the cheap cordless tools now. When, not if, they die. I just buy another one. Usually a Zito brand. Ben has... That's the red ones, isn't it? In fact, yes. He's got the rechargeable chainsaw of a Zito. Um... He actually really likes them, and they are cheap. They are really cheap. Uh, the batteries, you get a lot of batteries as well for not a lot of money. Uh, and he, he's been able to set himself up with quite a good range of tools, which he's been using regularly doing his shed, to be fair. Um, and I would say pretty much comparable to the Makita as regards performance. Um, maybe the, the, the 3 8 drive impact wrench from Makita is a little bit more powerful. We've got two of those, uh, and we work them hard when we're doing the roofing and stuff, and, and all the you know all the screws and stuff that go in. That's what we use. Uh, and one of them's done a lot more work than the other. One's older than the other one. Um, both are working brilliantly. We've not had any problems at all with those. But this is going back maybe two or three, maybe four years now for the newest one, and the other one will be maybe six or seven years old. So it's done a lot of work, uh, and they are brush type as well. I think. Daniel, I got a new rigid toolkit. It's an 18 volt brushless system. I, I do like the brushless stuff because, you know, the brushes are not going to wear out. It hasn't got any. Um, but there's a lot more electronics on the brushless which can fail. So it's a, which is why I believe that new Makita drill failed. It wasn't, it didn't burn out. It wasn't a power supply problem. It just decided not to work. The, 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 I remember when it failed, it got a bit weird on the trigger and then but the it would still it would still you know the chuck would still rotate and it still has full power uh and then it stopped activating the motor but it still did the little lights at the front um the headlights still came on when you did the trigger so i knew the trigger was working but it just decided not to run the motor anymore i, I don't know what was going on it wasn't working hard it was doing light duty I'd only used it for about half an hour out of the box and it just stopped working. Uh, and I think it was an electronic failure on that one. There was no smell, no smoke, no nothing. Uh, John Tyson, they are also very light. They are. Ben's, Ben's tools are definitely lighter in construction. Um, they don't weigh anywhere near as much as the Makita stuff. Uh, Simon, took three years misuse of uh daily for my dewalt drill before it needed new brushes yeah i used to i used to buy a new drill every two years and i think 
the plan is that if this new Makita drill dies, or when it dies, um, and I used to buy them every two years, then they do, I think it's a 30 volt one now, I saw on the shelf, a bit more money. Um, if I don't have any more problems with Makita tools, then I'll be looking at buying one of those as a replacement, a bit more powerful. Um, but it would mean then I've got a, a different charger for that drill and I would have to have a couple of batteries for it as well. So there'll be an additional cost there to set up, to step across to that. But for nearly all of our jobs, well, in fact, in all honesty, for all of our jobs, the 18 volt works just fine. We don't struggle um, at all. And I've got, you know, corded drills as well. So, and obviously the pillar drill and things. So it's, it's not really an issue. It's probably more of a wishful thinking um, thing rather than actual benefit to the workshop, really. So I'll have to reevaluate re when it comes to actually purchasing one. I'd probably, I'd probably bail out and not bother. Um, Daniel, just sent you a picture of my rigid toolkit. Okay. Let's have a look at that. Oh, look at that. So you've got a sawzall, by the looks of it. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Drill. And some other stuff. Some other stuffs. There you go, people. That's the rigid stuff. So I have. I think we can get rigid here in New Zealand, actually, as well. So we'll have to wait and see. But I mean, you know, obviously you work your tools very hard there, Daniel. Um, you know, they get a lot, lot of work. I wouldn't say abuse. They get a lot of work. Uh, you'll know whether they get abused or not. Oh, that that one is a. That's right. That's like a, a little one in the middle there. Look, is like a tool for that. It's a like a reciprocating orbital kind of thing for chomping through plasterboard and stuff, isn't it? For doing your sockets and things. And you can put wood blades on it. They're quite useful. I have got one somewhere. Not too sure. I don't really use it. I used it a lot when I was doing the house, but I don't really use it in the workshop as such. And that might be a Bosch, actually. It might be. So there you go. I might have a Bosch somewhere. Probably my only Bosch tool. Um, now then, uh, John Tyson. Yay, Simon Royal. I would like to get DeWalt stuff, but it's quite expensive here in Australia. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think DeWalt is owned by Black & Decker. Simon, DeWalt, Black & Decker, Mac, and loads more are owned by the same company. John Tyson, thumbs up. Yeah, come out of the same factory. Uh, bizarre, isn't it? Um, it's a bit bewildering what to go for, you know. Do you just accept the fact that they are a disposable item and you buy the cheap stuff and just use it till it pops? If it pops during warranty, they give you a new one. Um, so almost you, you're like paying for a lease on it, really, aren't you? Uh, or do you buy the stuff that you? it's probably going to last, hopefully, you hope that it lasts beyond the warranty period and you get a few free years out of it. Sort of rolling the dice. Um, but, you know, everything in this world is reducing in quality. Um, you know, I'm trying to be more competitive on price as a result. Oh, that's the argument that they use. Um, for the sake of a few more dollars, they could make things far, far better. Uh, and they would last a lot, lot longer. And I think that's that's the world we're in at the moment. You know, we're just turning into a mass disposable planet. And it's, um, it's a terrible shame. I, I prefer to buy tools and spend a bit more money on stuff that I know is going to last for say decades in some cases decades depending on the tool but um you know i want it to last a long time i want to get lots of work out of it and then i feel good that it's been uh, my purchase has been justified you know connor uh someone said once when buying power tools check if the warranty says commercial use and for how long good brands marketing diy store consumable versions deceiving and disappointing there definitely seems to be um, two bands of tools from Makita. There seems to be the, the lower end stuff, which is what Ben ended up buying with that kit because it was cheap and it was even discounted down on the day that he bought it, hence why he bought it. Um, and then there's the more expensive stuff, which you would hopefully assume, probably wrongly, but you would assume, given the, the price difference, that they are the more the commercial orientated tools. Um, the best tool I have ever purchased, and I'm going to get it out of the drawer because it's that good. Right, just bear with me a second. Now, I 
use an angle grinder an awful lot. And my last one from Metabu or Metabu, Metabu, um, it, it didn't burn out the motor. It just destroyed the bevel drive. And it was a very old tool and I've still got it. And I want to order the new bevel drive for it and fix it because you can never have too many angle grinders. But at the time I thought, right, it's time for a new one. So I bought this and has it got a sticker on it? It hasn't even got a sticker on it anymore. The stickers disappeared. Um, but it's a 125 mil, so a five inch size disc. It's pretty heavy to be fair, but this is a monster. It's ridiculously powerful. It's the most powerful five inch grinder that Metabu or Metabu produce. And it is so quick at cutting steel. Still very accurate, given despite the weight. And yeah, I can work this all day long. It is a commercial spec angle grinder. It was over $500, and uh, but it still has got the side trigger. Most angle grinders nowadays have got the, um, oh, what do they call it? You know, the, the paddle trigger underneath. And I find those really annoying because it, it dictates where you have to have your hand when you're using the tool. Whereas with this one, you can just turn it on and then you can manipulate the grinder and move your hands around to suit, which is how I like to use it. It's, it's traditional and you can do a lot more with them. And this is a brilliant piece of kit and well worth spending the money. Um, I did you know, wince a little bit at the price when I priced it all up, but I thought, no, no, it's going to last a long time. We need to buy a good one. And uh, when I'm doing lots of cutting, this is what I use. If it's just the odd little cut, I'll use the rechargeable grinder, uh, the Makita one. Uh, although saying that, I try not to put a grinding disc on the Makita or, a, or a, a seriously aggressive flat disc because that massively loads up the motor on it and it does get pretty hot and I want to, you know, make it last. So I don't want to overwork it, especially when I've got one of these in the drawer that, you know, I would just be lazy if I wasn't going to use this. So this, this is a bloody good tool and I strongly recommend that brand. I'm not too sure if they make rechargeable tools. If they do, I might be stepping to that because they certainly seem to be a lot more commercially used, a commercial use orientated compared to some of the brands out there. I'll have to Google it and see if they do rechargeable stuff and if and, and you know and do some research, see if they're any good. Anyway, back in a minute. Right, so we should have a little wander around the workshop, shouldn't we? So, unplug the phone, because it was nearly flat this morning. Uh, turn you around, three, two, one, boom. Okay, so where do we start? Well, Ben's shed. So I made these yesterday. Now, very simple. Uh, the pins, I didn't make the pins. You can buy these, but you can't seem to buy them on a mounting plate for timber. Um, so I had to cut down the depth of the pin. I wanted to have the the gap between the pin and the plate as close as possible to keep the doors in as much alignment to the frame as possible uh, so they weren't sat proud. So I cut about 10 mil off the back of the, the plate at the bottom to get it to hug a bit closer. And uh, they're all different. Well, they're, they're in pairs. So let me explain. Uh, that one, they've got B at the top. They're the bottom ones because of course the hinge uh, on the door frame is quite low on the frame so I wanted this to be lower down because obviously there wouldn't be anywhere for the plate to go it'd be inside the concrete so two of those uh, and then we've got the middle ones Look at those two there look and they've got M at the top it's just, I mean it's pretty obvious but I just wanted to put the labels on just to you know when you've got a punch set why not use it right and then of course we've got the ones that sit right to the top um, which again, you know, the top, top of the, the post is about, about, well, it's about there. So we've got a bit of, you know, a plate, most of the plates down on the post. So worked out pretty well. Uh, quite happy with those. Mrs. Mechanic gave me a quick paint last night. So they're all nice and dry now and ready for fitment. Um, but I messed up. And let me explain to you why. If I go over here, bum, 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 not too fast. Otherwise YouTube get upset. God, we're already over an hour. Holy crap. And I'll just grab some of these. So I was struggling to steal, as always. Uh, so I, I started off with these, a lot smaller. And <laughs> it turned out when I welded the first pin on, didn't even check. Of course, the pin 
was in front of the holes. So I couldn't, I could just about get the screws in, but it wasn't really ideal. And I wasn't happy with it. Uh, I brought the holes in a bit further in because of, I wanted to use countersink screws. And I measured the screw head at 15 mil across. And for some bizarre reason, I messed up and I marked 15 mil inboard when I could have marked, let's say, eight. If I'd done that, they'd have been all right, but they're nowhere near as strong as what I've made now. So yeah, the new ones give it a far better footprint against the timber. And we'll use those for something else. Yes, so I wasted about an hour messing around with those. Uh, oh, look. Okay, what's in the box? Of course, you know what's in the box. Yes, we decided, I decided on a, I mean, I've, I've been planning for a while, okay? I mean, it's pretty obvious what it is, right? It is a new chainsaw. Yes. Look at this. Bloody cool. Very, very happy with that. So I'm not going to start it up because it's really noisy and it's a Sunday morning. But uh, it's, I think it's about 32cc engine. It's got a pretty short bar on it. I wanted a short bar. I didn't want a long bar. Uh, so it's quite powerful. It's the it's the lower end of the spectrum of a commercial spec chainsaw. So it's built for, you know, high duty, a lot of work. Uh, it's not your domestic spec. I looked at a domestic spec one and, and Matt, who sold me this, said, look, they're a bit Mickey Mouse. They're only for sporadic use of you for what you use it for you'd be a lot better off getting a commercial one so i said fair enough doesn't matter and the price difference was about 300 dollars between the two so so what the hell we'll get it i did look at rechargeable chainsaws like uh like ben's one down there look uh as the azito one but i thought well we've already got a rechargeable chainsaw which is ben's so we need to get a proper one so there you go we now have a susquehanna chainsaw for the workshop and matt threw me in give him a shout out to kind of walk him up cycles he threw me in a chain sharpening tool and nice chap a spare chain as well look at that genuine part as well pretty cool so that's good it also tells me exactly what chain i need i need to order one of them if i need to order a new chain and he's a good lad he looked happy on the price very happy so thank you matt we'll just push that back a bit so it can't fall off and uh, so there you go, I'll turn it around for you. Oh, there we go. That's the one. It's a Husqvarna 435 X Torque 6 E Series. Nice. Very cool. And I had it fired up yesterday just to scare Mrs. Mechanic, and she was like, Christ, why have you bought that? And uh, another reason for not buying a rechargeable electric chainsaw was I didn't want Mrs. Mechanic to be using it, to be fair. Uh, no, I don't want to chop your fingers off. Uh, these are the hinges that we bought. So there's six of those. They sit very happily on there like that. So that should work just fine. And what else do we get? Oh, we got a little padlocky thing for the outside and a bolt for one of the doors so we can keep one of the doors shut, which will be the left door. And a little catch plate thing as well. They threw that in. Uh, but not cheap. I think I've got the whole lot, including the pins for about $180, $185. And it was a farming place that I got it from. Farm, no, ITM in the end. Went to Farmlands, they didn't have any. So I had to go to ITM and get these. These I bought these in uh, Matter Matter, I think it was. Yeah, Matter Matter, that's right. So that was pretty good. Uh, oh, while we're here, Ben got me a new blade for my circular, for my uh, cut-off saw, which is over here. Paid a hundred, this is Bikita. I paid $100 second hand for this. Pretty good. I do, it's done a lot of work. It's an LS1013 and he got me a nice new blade because the Andy that I am, that is still the original blade that the machine came with. So we've got a nice new one now. No need to fit it just yet. We'll, you know, a bit more life left in that one. We'll keep going. But when it does fail completely, we'll have a nice new one to fit, which is good. Assuming, of course, Ben got the right one. I think he did. And he got me some of these as well. I'm probably been grinding out yesterday. Just some little, um, basically, some magnetic sockets to go in my impact gun. So thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. You're a good lad. You are. Oh, and that's the paint that we've used. We use that on all the all the metal fittings and stuff. Bright zinc galvanic. I mean, it's not the best finish. Don't get me wrong, but it's it stops them rusting. It's good stuff. So happy with that. Right back to the bench. Turning around, three to one. Boom! I do miss my pie this morning. 
starving now. I wonder what Mrs. Mechanic's going to do for breakfast. Okay, still have the cold coffee. Oh, Steve, you're awesome, mate. Mm. Right, one more cigarette, and then we're going to call it a day. Because I've got work to do. I've got a lot of work to do. I can hear Ben's rummaging around outside now, so he'll be looking for things to do. Hopefully it's not leaking any petrol out of that chainsaw. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, bum, 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 bum. Vigiant, uh, Guido, that's a good brand. Guido hand tools used to be very good. They did, I remember Guido. Uh, with their warranty, now they are just crap. Oh dear. And they are made in South Africa, very sad. Oh, really? Guido's gone down that route. Jeez. Daniel, impact gun, sawzall, hammer drill, and reciprocating saw, buzz saw, and a four amp hour battery and two amp hour battery the charger and the case very good daniel good setup john tyson with some appliances andy my first laundry washing machine lasted 25 years the last one i replaced only lasted four years that is prime example of how things are going and it's terrible it really is we had a couple of whirlpool um washing machine well, washing machine and tumble dryer um they were Big, they were big ass machines, uh, American made, I believe. And they were brilliant, really, really good. Just lasted and lasted. And they, you know, they were easily repaired, parts you could get for them. They were designed to be fixed. They were designed for sort of semi-commercial use. And man, we, we used to wash all the overalls and stuff that we got, for, uh, we had for the quad biking, uh, the quad trekking activity within the UK and, and our, all our rugby shirts and jeans and everything went through that machine. And it did incredibly well. Very good bit of kit. It wasn't cheap, but it was really good. It didn't have many settings on it. It was pretty basic, but it was robust. That was the point. It was robust. Daniel, I love the buzzsaw. <laughs> Cheers, Daniel. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Mechanic was a bit shocked when I came home with that. She's like, I said, what's in the box? And she looked at the box and I don't know. I said, well, look at the box. It'll give you an idea. She had no idea. I said, I bought a chainsaw. And she's like, really? You bought a chainsaw? Why would you do that? I said, well, we need one. You want to chop some trees down. You need a chainsaw to chop trees down, right? So, Simon, look at the new battery tools. The old Boxford, eh? The old Boxford you have, that was made to last. It was. It was made to last. And it, you know, it's still working. I use it on a regular basis. Uh, the giant Metabu does make cordless power tools. Cool. Well, that might be what I switched to. I mean, it'd be interesting because it's a brand that you don't really hear many people using their cordless power tools. Um, so maybe I'll have a look at that. Maybe I'll buy a drill and we'll see how it gets on. Um, I wonder if um, Project Farm has covered uh, Metabu power tools, rechargeable power tools. I'll have to have a look. I'll flick him an email and see what he says. Uh, John. We had to do knuckle bearings on a three-year-old 900cc bike this week with less than 13,000 miles on it. Wow, that's terrible. Banana Brooks, knuckle bearings. Joe Nuttall, hit the like button, lads. Absolutely. Yeah, knuckle bearings, what are you on about? Wheel bearings? Head bearings? What do you call the knuckle over there? Simon. Snap-on are going that way. The snap-on guy has been avoiding garages that want tools warranted. Why I went to Fak uh, Faken, just post them off Project Farm. Has. Oh, cool. Okay. Interesting. I wonder, I wonder how it scored. Oh, that's the neighbour. Opening up his big shed, he's got a big shed next door. Oh, it's a grand shed, is that one? I really could do with that, but he can get his bus in it, I think. He has a little bus, big a bus, well, I say little bus, it's a bus, sort of camper van thing that he tours the country in. Um, they go away for months on end. They don't go away as much now, but they used to do a lot of traveling in it. But he has a good shed. And it's built for a boat, so it's quite high roller door as well. It's perfect, but hey. We've got some great sheds. I love my little workshop. It's really cool. I do I do like it. Put a lot of work into this place. A lot of work. And it's still evolving, you know? But it's very useful. It works really well. Oh, I did buy a, a Makita um, 
steel cut off saw for a particular job and it's never been used since it's not very accurate to be honest i should sell it I should give it to ben to sell because we don't use it it just sits on the shelf yeah maybe i'll give it to ben you go in ben's workshop what have we got oh nothing nothing important right i think nothing important at all no 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 nothing for you guys okay so i think guys we've come to the end of the live stream it's been a bit of a weird live stream no pie uh the giants i really need a new shed at home we all need new sheds i mean i could do with another well we're going to do the carport the side port that'll be great for storage but it won't be a fully enclosed shed it's just a roof uh it's got the wall against the workshop common and i think we might i'm still toying with the idea i might blank off the end wall to it to keep some of the weather out um, but it has got an overhanging roof by about three meters so i can't see the rain coming in i just want to put a concrete pad under that part just for putting pallets and stuff on a nice flat area um but again that's all work in progress that'll happen probably in a couple of years time when i get around to doing that concrete pad we'll see larry cox hello everyone Okay, crew, that's it. It's the end of the live stream. Thank you all very much for joining. I really, really appreciate it. Larry's in Windsor, Ontario, in Canada. Good man, Larry. Um, you'll have to wait for the YouTube thing to finish, then you can watch the whole live stream. But welcome to this one. Uh, the next one, Larry, just for your reference, will be in two weeks' time, 8.30 a.m. on the Sunday, New Zealand time, which is usually your Saturday uh, in Canada usually always is okay crew well until next time thank you very much for joining really appreciate all your support and i'll see you in a couple of weeks cheers now over and out oh it's on that side jeez always on the wrong side golly gosh